Stan Gutter, a mathematician, once said, the essence of mathematics isn't to make simple things complicated, but to make complicated things simple. This quote translates directly into this TED Talk I will be giving today by Randall Monroe, given in March of 2014, where he walks us through his website full of crazy, scientifically answered questions. So I have a feature on my website where every week people ask me hypothetical questions and I answer them using math, science, and comics. So for example, one person asks me, what would happen if you threw a ball at 99% the speed of light? Now, normally when an object flies through the air, the air moves around the object. But in this case, the ball would be going so fast that the air wouldn't have time to move out of the way. The ball would then knock into the air molecules, knocking away the hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen, fragmenting it off into tiny particles. This would create a wave of thermonuclear fusion around the ball, followed by a flood of x-rays that would spread out from the ball slightly faster than the ball itself. Now, about 30 nanoseconds in, light still hasn't had time to reach home plate yet. So the batter still sees the pitcher about to throw the ball and has no idea that anything is wrong. About 70 nanoseconds in, a bubble of exotic particles with plasma inside will be what's left of the ball and it will disintegrate the bat and the batter and the plate and the catcher and the umpire. Well, it also starts to throw them all towards the backstop, which it also starts to, dis to disintegrate. So if you were watching this far away on a hill, ideally, what you'd see is a bright flash of light that would fade over a few seconds, followed by a blast wave that would spread out from the stadium that would shred trees and houses, with a mushroom cloud rising up over the ruined city. So the Major League Baseball rules are a little bit hazy, but under rules 5.09 and 6.02, the batter would be considered hit by pitch and would be eligible to take first base, if it still existed. So those are the types of questions I answer. Another one I got was, scientifically, what's the fastest way to hide a human body? Can you do this one soon? But one day, I got a question about Google. If all of Google's data were stored up on punch cards, how big would Google's data warehouse be? Now, Google's pretty secretive about their operations. I've tried asking employees who work at Google and they're not giving anything away. So I did some calculations. The first thing we can look at is money. How much money is Google spending? Because they have to release an average amount of money to the public. And then we can see how much money they're using on building data centers, how much money they're using on buying the server racks, and so on and so forth. Um, another thing we can look at is power because Google has to run contracts with the local government to get the power supply. Google is more efficient than most, but they still have to have a limited amount of power to run the server racks. Another thing we can look at is size. You know how big one data center is, then you can average it out over all the data centers that you know of to see how much, how much data you can fit in each one. The final thing you can look at is the world hard drive market, which Google is actually taking up a pretty sizable amount of. I read a calculation at one point that said every one or two minutes, Google takes out an old hard drive and just pops in a new one. So there's a couple other things you can look at that I didn't use. The first thing is cell cam photos. People see the data centers and you're really not supposed to, but they'll take photos and post it on social media or the internet. Another thing you can look at is pizza delivery drivers. They actually know where all the Google data centers in their location are, at least the ones with people in them. The final thing you can look at is um, the Google recruitment messages, because they show you where they have people working in the data centers. So adding all of this up, I found my estimate of about 10 exabytes or so across all of Google's operations with another five exabytes or so in on offline tape drives, which it actually turns out Google is the largest consumer of. So it's pretty 
clear that this operation is huge, and no operation that I've calculated really sizes up to it. A lot of other people think, oh, the NSA, but we can use the same methods to calculate how much data the NSA has, and it's clear it's not the size of Google's. So using this, we can get to our final answer. How many punch cards would this take up? So 80 characters fit on one punch card, and about 2,000 or so punch cards can fit in a box. So if you were to put these punch cards, say, in my home region of New England, it would cover the entire region up to a depth of five kilometers, which is about three times deeper than the last ice age. So obviously this is impractical, but I posted it on my website and I said, well, I guess we'll never know. So a couple weeks later, I actually got a box in the mail and I said, thank you. I opened up the box and it was punch cards, Google branded punch cards. And on these punch cards, were little holes. So I got some software to read the holes, and it turns out it was a code. So I got some friends over, and we cracked that code. Inside that code was another code, and then we cracked that code. And inside that code were some equations. We solved the equations, and out popped Google's official comment to my page. No comment. So I love calculating these kinds of things, because it's no harder than moving some numbers around on a piece of paper. It's really just a Sudoku puzzle. But sometimes I don't love calculating these things. I got an e email in my inbox one day that said, urgent. If people had wheels, wings, and were able to fly, how would we distinguish them from airplanes? Urgent.